Hi, I'm Roland Sally, and I'm talking with David Ward today on the record, musicians on the record. I'm out in California, he's in Maine, so here's a little thing. If I was in San Diego and you was in Portland, Maine, I'd fly to you like stock and bone through hail and falling rain. Over the mountains and down in the valley, just trying to get to each other. Don't take us but a few minutes to get to one another. Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. You've heard the music, now hear their story, and you have definitely heard this guy's music. Since about 1985, my next guest has been the basis for Chris Isaac in Silvertone. He's also a Grammy Award winning songwriter. Roland Sally is on the show today. Welcome, Roland. Hey, great to be here. Thank you. So glad to have you here. Now, can we start with your song, Killing the Blues, won a Grammy when Robert Plant and Alison Krauss did a cover of that, and a bunch of other folks have done a cover. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, I want to make sure that you also won the Grammy for that as well, right? I do. It's, uh, it's, it's not in the picture. It's hanging on my wall just around the corner there. I did win a Grammy. One uh, wins a Grammy when uh, the song he's written is is you know elected to win win the award. And uh, no matter who sings it, uh, the songwriter likewise gets the uh, gets the you know accolade or whatever you want to call it. It was really nice to get it. And Alison Krauss and Robert Plant did a great job on that song. Unusual. I never intended to be a two part harmony song, but man, they really nailed it. Yeah, they really did. Amazing version. Plus, Sean Colvin has done it. Oh, so Sean Colvin. I mean, it, that's my personal favorite is Sean's version of it. She, uh, she just, when I heard that, I just I fell down. <laughs> it was really yeah. so cool. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a haunting song, Roland. And when I heard, I, I listened to the whole bunch of versions of it, including yours, which is great. I, I heard a little bit of Dylan in there. Uh, can you can you talk about the story about the song and what's the story behind it? Well, you know, so I, I I would refer to it as an authentic song because it's actually um, um, autobiographical. I guess I have to say uh, it's you know it's a song about about a personal situation and we, we you know we get we get fuel from those for songwriting and. Uh, there was someone I was with at the time, and uh, we we had agreed to to well, frankly, just say clean up our act. And uh, so I I did it, and she uh, she slipped, and we uh, we just um, it was it was a it was a fork in the road, and we came to that fork in the road, and I took it. <laughs> right. And um, uh, it was just uh, it was it was it was tough tough situation and I woke up one morning I was feeling so bad about it in my new little you know apartment up in Woodstock New York and uh, made myself a cup of coffee and that song kind of fell out on the table maybe took maybe about nine minutes <laughs> wow amazing when when did you write that song Roland it was a long time ago back in in, in the mid 70s yeah yeah and so you have been around a long time <laughs> Thankfully, right? Thankfully, yeah. And so you wrote it and recorded it. Did you have any idea or, or no, that wasn't the story of it? I had a good friend at the time in Woodstock named Jim Collier, who isn't with us anymore, but he's a fabulous songwriter, great singer. We were just so, so close and together. We would sing, we had a little band going, and we were really great friends. And um, there was kind of this thing where, where, when, where he'd write a song and bring it in and we'd, we'd look at it together and then I'd write one and bring it in and it was kind of this thing where we were kind of a team, you know, and when we wrote when, that particular song, when I wrote it, I finished it and I thought, I'm going to sing this for Collier because I think 
he'll understand for sure because he knows me. He'll understand where the song is coming from and everything, and I hope he likes it. But, you know, when you write a song uh, like that and it, you, don't, you don't belabor it too much, um, sometimes you're not sure if you've really written anything worthy or a good song or anything that'll stand up. It just comes so quick and you kind of, so I put that away and said, I'll sing this tomorrow and see uh, if, if it holds water in the morning. So the next day I kind of pulled out my guitar and ran it down and it sounded okay to me. So I played it for Jim and then I played it for another friend of mine named Johnny Harold from the Bluegrass Boys back in, back in the, in the village days. And he looked at me and he said, that song, it's going to go somewhere. He goes, I'll bet you $100 right now that song will do something. I, and I shook on it. And so years and years later, I sent him $100. Yeah. <laughs> he won the bet, right? Thankfully. Right? <laughs> yeah. you, pay up. <laughs> you bet. You bet. And I mean, I, I, I don't imagine you had any idea what life that song would take on of its own with these amazing other yeah. artists like yourself yeah. playing it. You, you never do. Um, uh, sometimes if you write lyrics that are, that are pertinent to a certain time or a certain, certain events that are going on, like in a, in a given time, like really specific, the song may turn out to be more of a, as a, of a specific time related song, but then other lyrics seem to sort of apply in general at any time. And if you're lucky, you can get a song you know, where you subtract it out enough of the, uh, you know, the current stuff and you, you get a broad meaning that, that sort of pertains to people in general and situations that people are going to be coming into throughout the history of mankind. You, you're lucky to get a song that will, you know, that'll stand up over time, but you don't even you really know. Maybe some people do. I suppose the, the guys who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow probably figured that they had some had a pretty good fish on the line. You know? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And you've written a lot of songs. I mean, you're clearly not just the bass player, um, but I'd love to hear more about your story because we try to get the musician story on the show here. When did music start for you? When did you fall in love with the bass and songwriting? How did that happen for you? There was always, uh, the first song I remember really loving when I was a kid was a song by Jim Reeves, and it was called He'll Have to Go. And I thought that was a pretty, again, a pretty time, time-worn time song that would last forever. <clears throat> and I love that song. I love the way, the way it sounded. And I probably you know, just a little kid at the time. And uh, uh, I knew from that song what the power of the song could be uh, if it was written you know, and, and, and so, and, uh, uh, I didn't really think about writing songs when I was too young, but, but when I, I picked up the bass when I was 15, uh, what happened was, um, my cousin and a couple of friends of mine from high school, we wanted to start a band. So we got all the equipment together that we needed for a band and we threw it in town and in the garage floor and said, well, what are you going to play? And so he picked the drums and the other guy picked the guitar. My cousin picked the piano and the only thing left on the floor was the bass. So I became a bass player that day. Okay. And, um, at the time I was a, a long distance runner in high school, <clears throat> a student. And of course, you know, when, if you pick, picked up a guitar and got into music at that time, you naturally just kind of wanted to grow your hair out a little bit right? sure. you know, with it. And, yeah. uh, uh, so I showed up my senior year in high school with 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 something other than a crew cut, which was a known home. And uh, the, the coach uh, kicked me off the team, and that's how I got my start in music. Okay, <laughs> that was what um, your path was supposed to be. It sounds like. But the song, the songs at that time were coming hot and heavy. They were coming from from people here in America. They were coming from from. From the, from the Beatles and, and, and you know, they're the white great songwriters. I mean, anybody that could that would study any number of Beatles songs would be going to the University of Songwriting, I, I think. Uh, uh, and, 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 of course, many others, Carole King. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm going to leave out millions if I start telling them most of them, but there's great, you know, there were great songs coming in. And I don't know, I, I, for some reason, we never, I was never in a cover band. Uh, we just always, I was, even, even when I was just getting started, my group was called The Group. I mean, we covered a few songs, but we moved towards uh, 
writing our own stuff. It's just kind of, a, of, of an avenue you take and you sort of stay with it. And uh, it gets comfortable. And you, in, in fact, covering songs begins to feel a little uncomfortable uh, if you do too much of it. Although it's a great way to learn, you know, how to, how to, how to deliver a song. Uh, when I was 18, I moved out of my hometown and went up to Madison, Wisconsin and started a band and we were 100% original. And we never did covers. Then I guess I've been doing that ever since. At least that's the way I think. Yeah. So that's if fascinating. Sing, my, my, yeah. If you're going to sing a song, it might as well be your own. Sure. Right. So, do you remember the, some of the first songs you wrote then? Oh, I had a, I had, I had a, one of the first ones I wrote was called Cowboy Woman. Um, it was just kind of a rock and roll song about a woman who she was kind of a cowboy, but she was a woman and she. You know, didn't she, let's say she was alien gender. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she she was um, uh, independent, free running, you know, horse riding, uh, tough talking mama. You know, yeah. it, was, it was kind of interesting song. People like that song, and there there were a few others, um, quite a few others actually from the old band. I could name a couple, but no one would know them. I don't think. Sure. Okay. And were there any important teachers for you, Roland, musically, whether the bass or even songwriting or any other musical teachers that came? You know, I never had a teacher really, other than just listening as a bass player. Because as a bass player, I was trying to learn the bass, and I was also also conscious of um, songs and lyrics, and and making sure that the lyrics were were as good as you can make them. And mostly that's done by subtracting out the chaff, you know, and trying to stick with what, what's, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of, of, of the lyrics of the song. But I was trying to learn bass lines and trying to learn how to sing and play bass at the same time, which is a bit of a challenge at first, you know? Sure. And there was one song that, that, that I had to sing in the band because I, I could sing and it was called Hey Joe, it was by, no, now you're going to come. It was either by the leaves or by the seeds. But Jimi Hendrix later, later covered it. Sure. Uh, and it had a pretty, you know, moving bass line, which, which to try to sing it and play it at the same time, it took me weeks to figure that out. I'd come home from school and just work on it. And finally, it, it, it all fell together at once, and I was able to sing and play the song at the same time. But that taught me a lot about singing and playing that particular song. And then, you know, we moved, moved into it other songs uh, uh, where you, you know, have to sing and play, which yeah. good education. Sure, that's incredible. And who, I mean, I know we'll probably leave some folks out just because that's the nature of this, but who were you listening to on bass that was inspiring you and songwriting-wise, other music? James Jamerson, James Jamerson was knocking me out because he was so good and so unique and, 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 and his tone was so good and he was so musical and, and uh, I found out later that he never played, even in studio, he never played uh, any take of any particular song the same way twice. He was just like a like an open faucet fountain of, of bass playing, and his story was fabulous. You know, he was he was he was not really an expert in anything except playing the bass. Uh, Paul McCartney was really in there for sure. Um, Carol Kay from the Wrecking Crew was really great. I loved her tone and. Um, Duck Dunn, we, we I cannot leave out Duck Dunn, who's may he rest in peace. What a fabulous bass player! And by the way, interesting, yeah, he was left-handed, but he played right-handed bass, which means that his strong hand was on the on the fingerboard. Right. And for whatever that's worth, I don't know how how that transmitted or trans trans you know translated into his tone, but his tone was, was fabulous and his time was powerful. Wow. So good. Wow. Incredible. Can you, you know, with some of the stuff that I talk about or ask musicians on the show is because you've had such a, uh, a rich and historic career around this, some of it is advice for up and coming future musicians as well. You clearly, you know, with Chris Isaac and others, you, you're part of that rhythm section that is really so important of holding the bottom line. Can you say a little bit about like, what is the, what is the top one or two things you got to pay attention to in the rhythm section? 
Well, when you're playing with a drummer, uh, I, I find it's nearly impossible for a bass player who's playing with his fingers. I mean, there's these guys who play real percussively and which, which the bass is a combination of a, of, a, of a bass and a drum, kind of. But when you're playing with your fingers, and, and you know, in, in, in the old, kind of the old style or the traditional style of playing bass, there's, it's almost impossible for a bass player to, to customize what the drummer is going to do. Uh, you, and, and what I'm trying to say is you have to listen to the drummer and you have, to, you have to be comfortable with what he's doing and you have to be able to follow him. You have to listen closely uh, and because, because we're, we're human, right? And, and, and a drummer who's human uh, is going to do, make some human, human, you know, things. There's going to be some shifting and some moving around and some innuendo and, uh, and things like that. And you can't, you can't fight the drummer ever. You have to play with the drummer. Uh, um, and sometimes you have to let go of time, uh, your sense of perfect time, because that doesn't always work. Uh, the Rolling Stones are a good example of that, because Keith Richards leads that man um, uh, with his rhythm playing, as far as I can tell. And Charlie Watts follows Keith Richards. Now, now the, the key here is that people are listening to each other. Charlie Watts follows Keith Richards, and then Bill Wyman listened to Charlie Watts, the drummer. So there was a chain kind of of, uh, of a three-way, three-link three chain, which developed and, 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 and carved out the, the feel of the Rolling Stones. And it's by no means perfect. I mean, you put a, put a metronome or a quick track on that, and it's really new. But ragged but right is, is all I can say about that. And, and that's... I think that's, I, I like ragged, but right rhythm sections. Um, the, the perfect, you know, sterile, perfect, you know, exact rhythm sections, I don't know, they don't move me as much. They're, they're, it's impressive, but it just doesn't move me as much as, uh, as when you really listen and don't try to hard nose it. Just listen and be, be a combo team player. Mm. Yeah, I love it. And great advice. Uh, and for me as a drummer, I, I love that because in my head, I'm like, oh, I need to follow the bass player. So it's kind of cool to hear you say you got to follow the drummer. <laughs> nice. I, you know, I've often uh, tried to imagine what it would be like to be a drummer in a band. And I have no idea. <laughs> I can't imagine. He's in the driver's seat. Uh, he's um, w w without, without a drummer who can, who can, who can, you know, deliver and render a song, uh, the song, um, you've you've got a problem. <laughs> right. I like. I read a read an interview one time with Buddy Rich, um, who they, they you know they he interviews. I think he's in Modern Drummer. And the interview was long, many many pages of interviews, a lot of great questions and stuff like that. And finally, at the end of the at the end of the interview, the guy said to him, well, "What inter uh, what advice would you give a young drummer who's coming up right now and he's got time problems?" Buddy Rich goes, "Quit." Right. Not to quit, but um, uh, you know, time is uh, time is relative. That you know, you know, you, songs need sometimes need to be massaged and, uh, and, and and delivered carefully. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Um, so, can we go back a little bit as well, Roland? And you know, when you're 18 and you're, before you're thinking about moving, you said you moved to Wisconsin, correct? I did move from 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 northern Illinois up to up to Madison, Wisconsin, which was a big uh, university town with a lot of uh, foreign blood from both from all over the country. It was a really great melting pot. That blew me away. Okay, awesome. So, what was the musical dream that you had formed at that point, as well as when you told the folks, "Hey, I'm moving and going to be making my way with music"? What was their reaction? Well. <clears throat> My dad, uh, who I love and who's a great character, uh, did most of the talking in that in that conversation. And his uh, his uh, he he had been a military man. He'd been all through World War II, D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, Battle of Holland. He had you know war stories that, that, that you know that, that could have been movies in and of themselves. But but um, and he you know he was hoping uh, that I would you know, be a military man, which, which was never going to work. I mean, I, you're looking at probably the least likely to succeed in the military person right here. Uh, 
but um, when when it finally came down to it, I was I, I was just about to turn 18, and he took me out on the back porch. We lived out in the country. He took me out in the back of the house in Vegas. See that cornfield right there? I go, yeah. He goes, I want you to take your base. He goes, walk through that cornfield. He goes, when you get to the other side, keep on going, and don't come back. Wow. <laughs> uh, that was that was how that conversation went. So. Yeah. It was kind of an unusual, different kind of support that I had from my dad and my, and my folks. Uh, they never thought that it was going to it was going to be a, a viable thing to do, but um, he did understand that. If and here's the other thing, I would say, don't ever give up because you, you could be winning and not even know it. You know, and uh, I never did give up. There were plenty of times when I had like I had a dime in my pocket. And it was Thanksgiving, and everybody had gone home for Thanksgiving. And I was just sitting there, and so I would go down and buy dimes worth of popcorn for Thanksgiving. That's called you know paying your dues. Yeah. I finally uh, got to the point where I was able to pay my rent, you know, by playing. And uh, and there was a number of years where we didn't really communicate much between me and my folks, but. Then when, when I got with Chris, we got on Johnny Carson one night and my dad was, and folks, my folks were home in Illinois and I think they must have switched on the TV and they saw me on TV and then it started to sort of mellow out. And by the time, uh, by the time my folks had passed away, we were, we were just perfect. Everything was great. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. And they that kind of went like this, ooh, and then it came back together. Yeah, so they got to see your success. Pardon me? They got to see your success. They wanted the best for you. They did, and um, um, uh, my mother was around when uh, when we did when the Grammy um, came came my way. Uh, my father was around, and, and by the way, he was a carpenter. And at, towards the end of uh, his life, we did a few pretty good carpentry projects together, and that was really good because uh, you know he was. I mean, we 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 patched up a lot of stuff by swinging hammers together, you know. It was really great. 